Hi, this is your girl Cream the Ice Princess, also known as K Fox, or shall I say K Fox, also known as Cream the Ice Princess. I just jumped off the porch with Dirty Glove Bastard. You guys have a blessed evening. Ciao. I'ma tell you a little something about me. A bank can't west side cream my pee at. I'm kinda dusted up from the struggle. Yes, sir, yes, sir. We right back at it, y'all. We got the one and only K Fox jumping off the porch with us today. How you feeling today? I'm feeling great. How about yourself? Uh, I'm feeling great myself, especially, you know, after that, especially after that dope prayer that, you know, we just experienced and did together, you know, that Praise energy is, on, is, is up high. So. Praise God. No. Praise God. Yeah, yeah. no, nah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So glad to have you here. Thank you. Um, you come here from, I mean, not even come here. I mean, you from the west side of Atlanta. From the west side of Atlanta. So, I mean, we, we, we basically in your neck of the woods. Born and raised Grady Baby. Word, okay, yes. okay. And for those who don't know, you know, what it's like or what it was like growing up on the west side of Atlanta, can you, can you paint a picture for us? Well, basically, I grew up across the street from uh, Lil' Bankhead. A lot of people know Lil' Bankhead from being on streets uh what is streets uh yeah, streets 945 streets 945 and i think he's on 107 out of v yeah, 103 yeah. and then we also grew uh i grew up across the street adjacent from um ti's people his okay. aunt and his uh uncle my mom and my uh aunts and all them they went to school with his people so a lot of successful people came from the era mm -hmm. that i was around and like my mom and my uh, aunts, they all know shawty low people from Bowen Homes. My mom was born and raised in Bowen Homes and then eventually moved to Baker Road where I was born. Mm. And I went to Grove Park Elementary School. Then I went to West Fulton for a short period of time before I got married. Then I uh, went on to a private school that okay. my husband okay. put me in. Yeah. Word. And uh, the West Side of Atlanta is legendary. You know, shout out to my boy Parlay. Uh, we always talk about this, yes. like on the tip of, you know, some people will say that the West Side of Atlanta has brought just as much to hip hop as a Brooklyn or a Harlem or a, a Compton or, you know, some of these main uh, cities and, and, and popular places mm -hmm. that we know in hip hop. Mm -hmm. um, can you, can you speak on that? Well, it's true because the struggle, one thing about hip hop, when you say hip hop and when you say rap music, it coincides with the struggle. It coincides with the black struggle. So we are rapping about the experience of being Southerners. And you know, you have your out West rap artists, you have your up North, so on and so forth. But when it comes down South, we are so um, hell bent on hospitality and those stories aren't told as much so I would say T.I. did a great job amongst other artists uh, Andre 3000 and you know Outkast they did a great job with displaying what hip-hop in the southern life really is about and uh, uh, Atlanta the outskirts of Atlanta have you know they have added to the integrity of the hip-hop culture here in Atlanta. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, did you know when you were in it that you were in the mix of, you know, something so historical? I had no idea. So to make a long story short, I came from one of the, and I'm not afraid to say it because people that know me knows my family. I came from one of the biggest drug dealing families in Atlanta. Uh, a lot of people don't know me because I left early on and went about my life. But when it comes to my mom and my brothers, so on and so forth, you know, uh, they are well known. So before I left, my uncle, who was like the family prodigy, he basically uh, introduced music to me by making beats. And he said, one day I want you to meet MC Shadi. And I was a little girl. Hmm. I didn't know who Shadi was, but shout out to Shadi. He's a great oh, friend yeah. of mine now. And uh, eventually I did get a chance to meet him, so on and so forth. But uh, I had no idea that I would be a part of something so legendary, so special. So that's why it was hard for me to leave it alone. Even being a wife and mother, I kept going back and forth, dabbling in and out of it, you know, wondering if I had a place in it. You know what I mean? Because it's hard, especially when you're trying to do it the righteous way 
and the right way. Gotcha. You know. Wow. Yeah. So um, you just said that you know you came from you know a, 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 a I guess a a famous or infamous you know family uh, here in Atlanta, but what was your growing up like like what did you how what kind of kid were you like what were you into i never got a chance to be a kid mm -hmm. i basically became an adult out of the womb and straight into adulthood mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm just joking but no seriously i didn't have a childhood very much so because of how fast my family's life was going so for me i just jumped into the fray with everybody else did what everybody else was doing until uh sense made sense to me mm -hmm. and then I had to make life make sense yeah. at a very early age. So for me, growing up in Atlanta, it is no different from, I guess, any other West Side person that doesn't have government cheese, uh, welfare, food stamps, so on and so forth until you, until you made it, right. you know what I mean? And then once the drug game came along, it, it was a, an unfortunate income that came and resolved a lot of family economic woes. Mm. And that was our situation. Got you, yeah. got you. And so can you, can you speak on, you know, like just the aspect of growing up, you know, within a family that's, you know, that, that's going in one direction, but then you knowing that, you know, you want to go in another direction or that that's not for you, like mm -hmm. how to, how, how often or how much did that com conflict with it you? It was a big conflict, especially coming from the west side of Atlanta, coming from Baker Road, everybody knowing who my family was and where I came from. And how dare you grow up and try to do something different? Mm -hmm. How dare you grow up and be different? But God had a plan for me to break cycle and to change uh, generational uh, expectation mm -hmm. and to create generational wealth. Mm -hmm. I didn't know at the time that that was what it was about, but I just felt something in me that was different that I did not want to do mm -hmm. that everybody else was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's interesting because it's, it's almost like people were mad at you for like stepping out of the family business. You pretty know, so. much, pretty much. Well, it was more so you want to be better right, than right. everybody else. Well, of course I did. I mean, who wouldn't want to be better than what they, right, right. you know, unfortunately was. Mm -hmm. Anybody that is struggling should want to do better than that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for me, I, once I stepped out on faith and God led me to where he wanted me to be, um, my family eventually came around and they was like, I understand. Mm -hmm. I understood, you know, why mm -hmm. you were the way you were, the, the kind of wife, the kind of mother you are to your kids and wanted your kids to go to private school, one of the best. I understand that now, but back then they couldn't see it because again, in our community, a lot of us is taught to shame one another when we make that daring leap mm -hmm. to do something different. We are categorized with the Caucasian race or mm -hmm. you want to be white, you want to be this, you, I want to be better than this, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you have a problem with it, that's a you problem, not a me problem. And that's something I had to grow into, mm -hmm. you know. And was, I mean, with, try, with, growing, into, with growing into that and knowing that you want to, you know, do something better, like, were you met with, I mean, was there a lot of pushback for you to try to, because I can understand, you know, f one standpoint of people just saying, hey, like, you know, you need to stick with the family business. But like, were there instances even where, you know, where you might've been blocked from trying to do some of the things you were trying to do or? No, no, I just, I thank God. I first thank God Almighty. And I thank God I met my husband at such a very young age. Mm -hmm. And he was working at Trust Company Bank very young and he was older than me but very influential mm -hmm. to what I wanted to be in my life. Mm -hmm. So I thank God he came into my life mm -hmm. and took me away from that and then that helped me to continue to blaze different trails and so on and so forth. But as far as them standing in my way, they never did that. They never hindered me. They never held me back. They just didn't understand it. Right, right. Yeah. 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 And so uh, when would you say you jumped off the porch? I, I jumped off the porch at about seven years old mm -hmm. when I had to learn to take flour and water and put it in some butter and learn how to make pancakes and put jelly on top in order to feed my brothers. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to let it do what it do, mm -hmm. you know. And one thing about my 
background and my upbringing. I used to be ashamed of it. I'm not anymore because it is what taught me. It made me into a very strong person. It made me respect my mother more because to know what she had to do back then and to dodge different bullets that was coming at her, it was it's just a phenomenal thing. And as a woman, mm -hmm. I just, you know, thank God for her and for teaching me how to hustle. One thing she did teach me to do is to hustle. Mm -hmm. So from paycheck to paycheck, from uh, tax return to tax return, I had to learn how to hustle. Mm -hmm. And I hustled that with my husband mm -hmm. and we had to build something from that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so where, so like, where did your love for music come from? Like, do you remember? I was little. I was little. My uncle used to make beats. And I remember just listening to female rappers like MC Light, Queen Latifah. When I got a little bit older, uh, I even liked Lil' Kim, you know, because of her hustle in his business. All the things that she was up against, she turned things into her favor and to make the industry respect her in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the business and when it comes to the music business, you can either respect the business or the music business or you can respect one or the other because I can be a fan of a person and not be a fan of their music, right. but I can like their hustle. Right. So I respect a lot of the hustle uh, that came from the industry. So um, it's one thing to know how to rap. Mm -hmm. It's another thing knowing how to perform. Mm -hmm. It's another thing knowing how to get in there in the studio, do what you gotta do and get out here and make, make this shit happen. Because it don't happen on its own. You can't expect for your manager to do it for you. You can't expect for nobody to do it for you. You gotta get out here and do it for yourself. Yeah. And that's one of the things I had to learn. I didn't, you know, if I was working at Walmart or Target or somewhere, I can't stand, you know, they're holding a cup of liquor in my hand mm -hmm. because I'm on the job. So I'm not gonna do it when I'm working for myself either because right. this is my career. So I respect what it is that I do. And one thing about it, you know, the love of music, when it's in you, that passion is in you, you're gonna do it and you're gonna do it the right way to have longevity. Yeah, yeah. And so at what point did you know that you wanted to pursue music professionally? I was about 10. Okay. I was about 10 years old when I wanted to pursue it professionally. And then when I got to be about 12 or 13, I think that's when I met 13 or 14, when I was a teenager, I met my husband. Mm -hmm. um, he was a DJ. Okay. And then he, um, he said he was looking for somebody to, to uh, <laughs> record in his studio. Okay. So I was just sitting there and they was like, she can rap, she can rap. And then everybody moved and I looked up at him. I'm like, I can rap. And he's like, little girl, no, you can't. So I rap for him. Mm. That's what's up. Yeah. And <clears throat> from there, like, was it like an instant, like, you guys just started working together and, no. and building? Or? Oh, no. No, not at all. We did not. Because it was like a one-time thing. We, uh, after then, um, he pretty much would come to the house and see my brother or his brother, because his brother was a roommate of ours. And uh, we would just running into you know just running to each other and eventually i took a liking to him and then we started a family gotcha of course there's more details than that but you gotta buy the book right <laughs> you gotta buy the book right 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 <laughs> and then can we can we let's let's talk about the book because during the pandemic now you were supposed to release an album i have two albums endangered species and brick city that i didn't even completely get a chance to put out so during COVID, uh, my youngest daughter was diagnosed with autism. At that point, I just didn't have it in me to get out here and do it anymore. I wanted to stay at home with my daughter and, and take care of her because I was so hurt, you know, because of, of autism, how it runs through our family. Mm -hmm. And um, I had already taken away from our four oldest mm -hmm. by being out here on the underground for so long. And uh, I didn't want to take away from her. Mm -hmm. So when the pandemic hit, I got closer to her and decided not to go back into my career anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, during that time, I was blessed to get a multi-book deal with uh, Brunetta Nelson, an imprint publishing company. Mm -hmm. And um, I started just, you know, concentrating on being a writer and 
praying to God that we can sell the rights to Tyler Perry or any other person that comes with the higher bid and is interested in the the uh, the four volume okay. book novel. Or, hey, did I say that right? The four the four volumes because we have four volumes. There's four more books and then so on and so forth. I have other books. Oh, okay. But um, apart from that, I just didn't want to do it. And then my husband met. Uh, a friend of his named Mikhail, and Mikhail introduced us to Roland. And it's just been, Roland was like, you need to get back into your career. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't want to get back into my career. And Roland said, well, you need to get back in your career. Hmm. I said, well, I don't want to get back in my career. And Roland said, you need to get back into your career. Yeah. So I did what Roland said, dude. Okay. <laughs> Sound like Roland is an insightful guy. <laughs> Roland, yeah. Yeah, praise God. But I thank God Almighty for my husband meeting, meeting them, mm -hmm. you know. And them, you know, letting me know, look, it's never too late. You yeah. know, you get out here, you, you still got music to promote. Mm -hmm. The world need to hear it. So Absolutely. Yeah. Show your creativity with the world. Right. So yeah. Diary of a Trophy Wife. Um, can you tell us a little bit like what the book is about? So this book is about two people that have come from a tumultuous background. Preferably, mm -hmm. well, let me rephrase that. It come from we it was two people coming from a tumultuous background. My husband and I, this is this is basically our story. It's based on a true story. Okay. My husband grew up in the bluff. Me growing up on the west side. And you have two people that went through hell together, which people call well trauma bonds. Well, you're yeah, supposed to be trauma, you know. Mm -hmm. One thing about if you're a black you're living in the United States of America. You're going to have some kind of trauma regardless because Absolutely. of what happened with slavery right. have trickled down one way or another. So it's going to be trauma regardless. Yeah. The question is, can you get through that bullshit by your t Can you get through it? Can mm -hmm. you get through the can you unpack that baggage mm -hmm. once you meet each other? It's like when you are in a relationship this person got a suitcase, that person got a suitcase, and you coming in each, to each other's homes, and you open that suitcase, and you get ready to take your stuff out, he get ready to take his stuff out, and like, hold on, wait, 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 that's just too much, I can't deal with that. Mm -hmm. So, you packing it back up. Now, it, you know, and not only are you packing up what you just took out, but you just packed up this hurt that this person just said that they can't deal with it, so they, you know, you taking it to another relationship. Mm -hmm. So he and I was basically, we were blessed to be able to unpack everything mm -hmm. from his childhood to mine. Mm. And we fought it out. Mm. 26 years, mm. we battled it. And I humbly thank and praise Almighty God that I didn't run because had I ran or had he run away, other people would be enjoying the, 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 the what do you call it, the experience that we had to go through with each other and what we learned from it. Mm -hmm. So we had to learn to, t to talk to each other better, to treat each other better. But the most important thing that I had to know is that as a black man, he needed nurturing mm -hmm. because he couldn't get it from his mother. His mother was ill. She couldn't give it to him. Mm -hmm. So as a mother, I'm not his mother, but as a mother, I understood and I love him enough mm -hmm to give him a mother's love, not his mother love, right. but a mother's love. Right. You know, this is my son, Cario. He's a rap artist as well. And um, being their mom taught me how to be more loving and gentle to my husband mm. because he didn't get a chance to get what they got. Mm. And unfortunately, that's the case with a lot of our black men. Right. They just didn't get nurtured. Mm. And unfortunately, there's a war between black men and black women. Yeah. It, like I've never seen before in my entire life when we both have walked these trenches together. Yeah. There's no I and team, there's no little me, big you and vice versa. Yeah, it's a crazy war like when, within, you know, black men and black women. I mean, you look online, I mean, I feel like every other blog platform is posting, you know, these different scenarios in which it gives men and women a chance to basically just fight over their perspective it's a distraction. of that scenario. It's a distraction. Yeah. It's a distraction. How much should a man spend yeah. at the restaurant on the first date? Uh, how, you know what I mean? Like, should well, a man first pay of all, all the bills? Nobody, like, cook? nobody, <laughs> <laughs> you know? nobody talk no more. Right. Where's the conversation? 
When you go to a restaurant, look around you and see how many people are in their phones. Mm -hmm. The phones have taken the conversation away. We don't talk to each other anymore. Yeah. So once we get to a point of where we can communicate with God and communicate with one another, we can start seeing the families become whole again. Absolutely. Until then, we're going to continue to be at war with one another. Oh, for sure. And then, too, I think that, you know, for a long time, you know, black people have had an issue where we look at, you know, Western living or we look at, I'll just say it, like how white folks are living or moving. And we sort of like, base our premonitions or base our, um, you know, base things off of that. And, and us as black people, for the most part, I mean, we are a broken people. We you, are. And so, but then when we put that pressure to be at this particular place in life or to, at this particular place in thinking, when some people just aren't because of, you know, those things, then I, I think that we just are looking at each other almost like with an unrealistic uh, lens, like unrealistic it's unfair. expectations. It's a, it's to a, a very, degree. it's a, it's a very unfair scenario. When you look at, okay, I remember talking to this guy on social media one day because he was just going in on black women, and I just had to say something. And he was like, "I want me an old-fashioned woman, old-fashioned this, old-fashioned that." Mm -hmm. What is old fashioned to you, young man, and you in your 30s? Hmm. What do you know about old fashioned? And if you knew about old fashioned, are you willing to do what it takes to get an old fashioned woman? Hmm. If you want a woman to respect you, do you realize first and foremost, you have to respect God in yourself hmm. because you're going to be a reflection of what you want. If you carry yourself in a way that you don't care about yourself, then don't be surprised when a woman don't care anything about you. We as women, we have our guard up and it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. We don't feel like it. But unfortunately, there are men don't realize that the reason we have our guard up it's because somebody somewhere did our mothers and aunties and grandmothers wrong and we're afraid that you're going to do us the same way. Right. So until you can show me different, because your accent, actions is showing me that you're still the same, it's like they passed the handbook down to you. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't their fault. You go even further than that. It's the welfare system that set it up so that the home can be broken down. And then somebody said to me, well, you could a, a woman could have chosen whether or not to take welfare or not she could have but her babies could not right she could have said all day long i don't want it but what do you do with hungry babies i saw it in my household my father was a college graduate he played basketball with dr j my mother was pregnant with my twin brothers me and my youngest me and my uh, brother next to me so she almost had four children they gave her a voucher to move into hollywood court but my father couldn't go. So he went and tried to get a job. He tried to get a job and this man turned to alcohol because of, oh, you're overqualified. How are you overqualified for something that this system have taught you to be qualified for? Right. So you can't take care of your home. So what, you can't go to your house, so you go to the liquor house. Hmm. You can't even go to your own home. And in what respect she gonna have for you when the government have become her new man? And it is what it is. Yeah. So you got to break down the systematic intention that was placed before us because neither one of us done it to each other. It was all by design. Let's go and get rid of the design. And then after that, if we choose to still be the way that we are, then we have a problem. But we didn't do this to us. Right. Somebody did this to us. Right, right. Yeah, no, nah, it, it, it's crazy. I mean, it's like... We need to be able to, um, like, you know, black people need to be able to heal. Yes. Black people need to, you know, be able to express ourselves without being judged yes. amongst each other. Yes. Um, if you let a person talk long enough, you'll find out how much they're hurting. Yeah. Yeah. Really? When a person try to tell you about you hmm. and the things that they feel like you need to know, hmm. let them talk long enough. You'll hear the pain there. Wow. <laughs> Just don't say nothing. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. but, you know, they're, they're talking from their own pain. 
from their own experience. Mm -hmm. And then they want to place it on you, but that's fine by me. As long as you're getting it out, I'm okay. But first and foremost, we can't do anything about our future until we learn about our history. We got to find out who our family is. We got to find out who our people mm -hmm. are. That's what I did when I, before becoming an author, I had to go find out who my family was. Mm -hmm. I find uh, we're related to the Dobbses, John Wesley Dobbs, Maynard Jackson. Mm. And it was told to me that, you know, this person married a dark skinned person. It, it, it is deep. Mm. It gets deeper. Mm. You did like Ancestry.com? No, or? I did it. Me, my daughter and I, we went from family member to oh, family wow. member. Really we went talked. To the family we tree. Yeah. Right. <laughs> because my great, my, my grandmother did not talk to her grand uncle because she was told that they were better than they were. I'm like, well, he's my uncle too. I'm gonna pick up the phone and I'm gonna call him. Mm -hmm. So when I called him, this man was so gentle and loving and he was like a grandfather to me until the day that he died. Mm -hmm. And everything that my grandmother was told was a lie. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he taught me everything about who we belong to. We was bought by Newton Dobbs. My great, great, great grandfather was a Pullman porter. He taught me how John Wesley Dobbs came about and so on and so forth. It's, it's sad, but family can destroy family. Hmm. And that's why there's a difference between family and relatives. So I went and found the truth for myself, but I had to understand that they were living in a time where light skinned it was more receptible than it was right. for a dark skinned person. And all they were doing is surviving. They didn't mean no harm. Mm -hmm. they, they was just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. They was just trying to live. Mm -hmm. They wanted to get to where we are today. Mm -hmm. And if they can see where we are today, they would be so ashamed of us. Mm -hmm. They would be embarrassed because this is not what they fought and died for. Right, right, yeah, no, that's real. Um, can you speak to some of the adversities that you've had to overcome, um, you know, over time? I mean, you were a teen mom, right? Uh, yes. I am proud to be a teen mother. I was a mom before I could even vote mm -hmm. or get driver's license. Mm -hmm. But being a mother, a young mother at that, it taught me to fight hard. I didn't want our children to go through what my husband and I went through. I actually slept outside on the concrete to get them into a school because, you know, it, it was, it, you, you had to pull the numbers or whatever number you were. I slept outside my husband and I to get them into that traditional thing school and they got in there. Mm -hmm. So once they was done with traditional thing school, they started to go to boarding school, mm -hmm. which is during a boarding school curriculum that I taught at home. Mm. So they was homeschooled, graduated from high school. My daughter graduated with a 4.0 GPA. And now she's my assistant. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. And then Cario, of course, he's doing his own thing with the music and they look up to me quite a bit because I grew up with my children, mm. you know. And, 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 and to me, you know, they treat me like a big sister sometimes, but they do respect me as their mother. And I wouldn't, take it, I wouldn't take it back, but you know, going in and out of the industry, I couldn't just go straight into the industry, make hits, do this, do that. I had to think about my family. Mm -hmm. But I will be honest with you, the first thing I've always wanted more than anything was God and family. Mm -hmm. Because without that, nothing is, is, is worth it anyways. Yeah, yeah, nah, I mean, that's the most important structure, you know, of this. Yes. You know so having daughters, um, you know, there's this big national news right now. Mm -hmm. Carly Russell. Okay. Uh, you know, this girl calls um, home, also calls the police, tells them she sees a toddler on the side of the road and basically is missing for a few days and pops back up on her parents' doorstep. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like, what's your, just what's your thoughts, you know? Why did on, she do that? Why? I did mean, she say why she did it? She hasn't said anything yet. So everybody is just speculating. Everybody is, is just stringing together what the cops have said and what. what? Not necessarily, because mm -hmm. it's like they've gone to like Google, 
mm -hmm. and her Google searches mm -hmm. are about the movie Taken 2. Uh, how old do you have to be or how much does it cost to create an Amber Alert? She Googled a bus ticket from Nashville to Birmingham. She's from Birmingham. So like they, they, they've so come to find out that it was a hoax. Here is my question though to all of that. Why did she do it? Right. Why? I would like to hear from her. What made her go that far mm -hmm. to push buttons that is so difficult to be pushed. Right, because she kind of play in that when, um, trafficking yes, lane, yes, you know, which is like yes, very important. Yes. Yeah. So that's kind of what I want to tap into. Like, yeah. you know, you, you know, having daughters and, and just, you know, just this being such I hate a because it happened. You know? I hate that it happened. I really do hate that it happened altogether. I hate that it happened mm -hmm. because God forbid one of our family members go missing. Right. How would social media act? Now, here again, what are the odds of a person returning to life and not dead? You know what I mean? All right. we, we all pray for a safe return. And in her case, there was a safe return, but you can't play on the emotions of people and drag them into your problems. Right. And that is what people are angry about because she made the world a part of her. A, a, she put her problems on the world Absolutely. and it's so disheartening and it's just so it's just heartbreaking and it's upsetting and as a mother as a mother I would want to know first and foremost don't worry about what the world got to say don't worry about being judged tell me what made you go this far for you to have to do that that would be my question and two I wouldn't defend it I would show people you know what I'm gonna stand on this and I'm gonna be on her like you are on her because it's wrong because that what if her parents would have had a heart attack behind that right. you know what i mean right. so being a mother of, of three daughters i i just hate because she done that yeah. because who's gonna take us serious and see that and, and that's my thought with it is you know do you feel like future you know missing black girls will be taken i don't think serious? so i think the way that our people showed up and showed out. Mm -hmm. It showed us the power that we have. Even when a young lady was killed uh, in Mexico, mm -hmm. how black people, they didn't play the radio about making these, uh, her friends accountable, even though they cannot be prosecuted over in, in Mexico, mm -hmm. the prosecution of the people is real. Right. So they would never live normal lives as long as they live. They would never be able to show their faces in normal society. So at the end of the day, I just hate that it happened altogether. I think her name was Shanquilla Robinson. Yep. You know, and I think through what happened with Shanquilla Robinson, even though it was the perpetrators were black people, black people didn't care because you're a black person that took another black person's life and we're supposed to matter to each other. So let me show you how much we matter. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe that the fact that we are becoming to matter more to each other today mm -hmm. and social media has been um, very instrumental mm -hmm. in our community. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So I, I don't think it's going to hurt us. I think it's going to make us stronger. Yeah, yeah. Nah, definitely. I yeah. agree. I agree. I just I just hope that on the national level, when other black girls, you know, you know, do come up missing or mm -hmm. need help or things like that, that is not taken as a joke. You know, mm -hmm. it's not the you know, cry wolf. Of course. Kind of, situation. of course. But again, we are one thing about us as a people. We're very powerful people. We just don't see how powerful we are. Mm -hmm. We forces. We force mm -hmm. the news and everything to react because of how we are, because they don't want to be caught left out. You know, it's all over social media, so why isn't it on CNN? Why isn't it on Fox? Why isn't it on uh, Good Morning America? Are you all biased? You know, those questions will come into play yeah. because it's everywhere else. So I believe, you know, as our own entity, as our own group, we're starting to push the envelope more about who we are as a people and making society to give a damn about who we are. We're yeah. taxpayers. Why shouldn't we? Yeah, no, nah, true, true. Yeah. So I'm riding in my car. You know, I've been in Atlanta since about 2016. Okay. I'm riding in my car, listening to the radio, and 
this damn one eight hundred injured commercial. <laughs> <laughs> when I tell you that I probably know the 1-800 injured song more than I know some of the most popping songs that's on the radio. Oh, in an accident, in an accident, 1-800 injured. I'm cream with so many wrecks on the street and your I-N-J-U-R-E-D. Yeah, that's me. I, I just did, I, I did 1-800 um, injured. And I just landed another deal with Pain to Wellness, Dr. Carhee, uh, oh, wow. Dr. Shantae and Winston Carhee. So you'll be hearing that on the radio pretty soon. But with Dr. Doctors, uh, Shantae and Winston Carhee, they are very, that's very personal mm -hmm. because they have actually taken care of our family for the last 13 years, okay. our overall health. They are very good people, godly people. Uh, they have a practice, again, called Pain to Wellness. But um, I just got, you know, their contract to do their jingle with them. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's very personal for me. I was glad to get them because I can actually attest to their services. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did you even get into Writing this jingles. world of doing jingles? Yeah. I actually had a years ago. Now, my husband, I don't know if anybody know if, you know, people that are from Atlanta, if they hear the song, do your dance, do your dance. So my husband mm -hmm. put Ben Hill Squad and gets Guillotine out along with his partner, JT Martin. Uh, JT had an attorney at the time that owned PZI Jeans before they sold PGI, PZI Jeans. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. I did a jingle for PZI Jeans and unfortunately the equipment was stolen, so they never got it. So I did another commercial for my brother-in-law who had a mobile shoe, sign, mobile shoe shine business. I did his, and then I learned how to write jingles. So I wrote jingles and been writing jingles for a very long time for a lot of major companies. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, because a lot of artists don't, you know, even know about that side of the game or don't even oh, know. Oh, yes. That. Um, exercise. Anytime you have an, one thing about when you are a writer, you have the ability to make things happen, you know, from books to poetry to music to jingles to phrases, to a lot of different things. And I was blessed to tap inside, you know, I couldn't, one thing about this industry, where we are, what I call it, the ego music, because we're, it's not rap, mm -hmm. it's not hip hop either. I call it ego, because mm -hmm. people are selling their egos. Mm -hmm. And along with the ego music, you got fuck me music, hate to say it like that, mm -hmm. but you got ego music. So he's sticking his ego in her fuck me music and we getting these little angry babies and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But that's another story. So um, when you are really about your craft and you care about what you're putting out, you can actually write something meaningful mm -hmm. for a brand that someone uh, is trying to promote. So that's where the uh, my, my compassion come from when I write jingles. I want to focus on the actual company mm -hmm. and not my ability to rap. Gotcha. And how'd you link with Bethune? Uh, P. Brown. Oh, P. Okay. Brown is one of, one of the... Yeah, shout out P. Brown. Yeah, mm -hmm. P. Brown is one of the... There's my producer. The P. Brown is one of the biggest uh, female, one of the biggest female promoters mm -hmm. in Atlanta. And at the time she had me going crazy ringing all kind of bells in atlanta yeah. and i asked bethune i said uh she was promoting for bethune and i asked that he need a commercial mm -hmm. he said yep and i got the commercial done and i ended up doing 1-800 injured for atlanta and i also did the one for miami oh okay yeah. okay oh so you you, you syndicated <laughs> <laughs> so uh someone else is doing his commercials now <laughs> Hey, but see, that's why you, you, you still booking them, though. You still locking them. Hey. It's all good. Yes. All right. So, and then you have, a upcoming, you have a reality show um, as well. So we're trying on. to do the reality show, but because um, Mr. Roland uh, Dixon wanted me back into my career, I had to kind of put it on the back burner for gotcha. a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted people to get a chance to see what it's like being a mother of five. Mm -hmm. You got four kids, adults and uh, a little girl, but everybody is entitled. Nobody wants to date, mm -hmm. you know, and what? Everybody want to do it. it is. You won't have to say nothing. <laughs> but the point of the matter is, um, nobody want to date. Everybody is entitled. 
everybody wants what they want. Mm. And I have to deal with the testosterone and the estrogen and trying to run several companies. What is it like raising, you know, raising five children um, as well as running these businesses and, you know, everything that you're doing? Like, what, what, what are your days like? That's why we need a reality show. <laughs> Like, when do you sleep? I don't. What time I go to sleep? I don't know. I barely go to sleep. I but know. I ain't asked you about you. I said, what time do I go to sleep? I don't know. By the time you sleep, I, mean, I don't know what I be doing. I don't, I don't, I don't know. know. What you, I don't know what you be doing. Anyway, okay, so I go to sleep around 4 o'clock in the morning, and I wake up probably around 7 in the morning. Mm. Um, I'm constantly doing stuff writing my daughter has her own manga series coming out so we back and forth helping each other mm -hmm. in the midst of that uh just running the business and running the numbers and we have a roadside service company that i'm retiring i just re i retired my husband from one job I'm retiring him from the main one oh, okay so that um we can focus more on what we got going i didn't know i was gonna go back into my career rolling mm. <laughs> So it's true what they say. They say you find they say you find a good woman as a man. They say you find a good woman and she'll help you to like get to those places where you need to get to in life. I just heard you say uh, I retired my husband. Like, I'm happy to say I retired my husband. My husband been working so hard mm -hmm. ever since he was a child. And he just worked to make sure me and the babies had what we needed. Mm -hmm. One thing about him, he's so honoring. He did not, he did not like handouts. He didn't like government assistance. He didn't like that in his household. Mm -hmm. And that's something I had to respect. And um, he worked two or three jobs if he needed to. And while he was out working, I was taking care of the home, mm -hmm. taking care of our babies, homeschooling them, making sure that when he got home, he didn't have to touch anything in the kitchen or or whatever, everything was already prepared for him, mm -hmm. making sure he's as comfortable as he can be because he's out there facing the world. He don't need to come home and have to, you know, not want to come home. Right. You know, I, I've been blessed to talk to my grandmother. My grandmother always gave me advice on what to do and to keep home happy for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's always loved coming home, mm. you know. So, um, like I said, as he got work each job, I would say get our credit up from paycheck to paycheck to um, tax return to tax return. We take it and invest it. I don't care if we invest it in stock and crypto, we're investing in something that we're gonna be able to see some residuals for in the long run. And uh, we invested in my career. We invested in a roadside service company we invested in our children's future. Mm -hmm. We invest to just continue to invest. Yeah, that's what's up. That's yeah. what's up. So now tapping back into the music, because you um, you jumping back into that side of the career. Like, um, have you been recording lately? And what um, can we expect? Yes. Uh, well, I actually going back to release a couple of songs on uh, Endangered Species. OK. Which is Grey Goose. So Grey Goose is uh is what we're pushing now okay so we got great goose also have rectify and side chicks okay and are these out or are they setting you're setting them up for re-release there what are we doing rolling setting them up for re-release okay so yeah i'm gonna hear them very soon okay Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. no, that's what's yeah. up. Yeah. And um, what else are you working on that you're excited about? I have the Diary of a Trophy Wife. We have a Diary of a Trophy Wife burlesque, mm. Diary of a Trophy Wife uh, rectified, mm -hmm. and the Mother of a Trophy Wife, which will complete the Trophy Wife series. Mm -hmm. And then I have my next series of, I'm not going to release the name yet, okay. but then I have a children's book series coming out. But, um, yeah, this is me and this is my husband. Oh, okay. On the front and on the back. So, yeah. Right. And see, this focus on Shawnee and Noah mm -hmm. and their relationship. Mm -hmm. But the second book would be focusing on Shawnee and Noah's friends mm. and what they go through. Because see, people think just because 
people have money, they don't go through things. Bullshit. Hmm. More money, more problems. That's what Bullshit. they say. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> no money, just highlights the problem. Uh -huh. It be some when you when a person don't have anything, then somebody just don't give a damn. Yeah. When you get a little bit, everybody care because everybody want to see that you know that downhill. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, but not everybody, but some people. Yeah. K Fox, what would you say is um, one of the uh, biggest life lessons that you've learned? So far, I'm still living. Mm. I don't know yet. I don't know. Okay. What would be, what would be, um, what would be like something that you would share, you know, with some young, with a young woman who's you know, looking to overcome some adversity, wants to get into the industry or, or any industry and is just overcoming adversity and wants to quit and is right there, doesn't know that they're right there, but is, is ready to quit. Like, what would you tell, you know, a, a young lady that's willing, that's ready to quit their passion? My question is, do she believe in God? Mm, I like that. As long as you believe in God, not a devil in hell can take anything away from you. Mm. Nobody can do that. Only you can do that. With the free will that God has given us, a lot of us have even made our lives shorter by doing stupid things. Mm. And giving up is one of the most stupidest things mm. that anybody could do because you're letting yourself down at that point. I'm not judging anybody. Mm. I'm just saying it's a stupid thing to do. Mm. Hell, I gave up. But then I had to get up and not give up like five minutes later mm -hmm. because my babies is looking at me. Mm -hmm. My husband is looking at me. Mm -hmm. My family needs me. Mm -hmm. So I, giving up for me isn't an option. Mm -hmm. So that has to become not an option. Giving up for them has to become not an option. Yeah. And to just keep going. And as long as you got God, everything is going to be all right. Wow. You looking at an eighth grade dropout here. Hmm. I dropped out in the eighth grade. Nobody thought I was going to be anything. Hey. <laughs> you say, look at me now. <laughs> the proof is in the K-Fox. Hey, that's what's up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, um, you got any last words or any shout outs that you want to give? I have words, but not no last ones. <laughs> Any last words that you would like to leave our viewers with? <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm a silly person. Um, well, viewers, thank you all for listening and tuning in. And I'll see you all um, on the top. Thank you, Spitty, for having me. That's what's up. Thank you, uh, everyone, the staff from Off the Porch, for having, me, having us, having me, Cario, and our family, my kids are here, my husband, my brother-in-law, uh, Blacksmith, who's also my producer. He's the one who did the track on Rectified, rolling in his lovely wife. Thank y'all just, you know, for making it possible. And get ready for K-Fox. Right. <laughs> I'ma tell you a little something about me. A bank can't west side cream my pee at. I'm kinda dusted up from the struggle. I ain't looking for a love.